Welcome to the HVAC Hour podcast, distillery podcast actually, where we talk about everything and anything HVAC are related. So topics include components, applications, um, trends the industry may be going towards, things that have or may be of interest to anybody that's you know involved working in or has a job related to this industry. My name is Jamie Kitchen. I'm going to be your host. And as always, we welcome your comments, questions, queries. If you happen to share some experiences that relate to the topics that we're talking about, please share them. We look forward to hearing to you guys. So today we're going to talk about the TXV. Now, I know there's a lot of TXV videos out there, and they talk about how the TXV works, the balance of forces, the function of the sensing bulb, you know, the springs and the orifices and these kinds of different things. And they're very important. I'm not saying they're not. But what I want to do today is talk quickly about a few things that are maybe a little more advanced than that. Things you've often wondered about or questions that I get. Okay. So we're going to talk about setting superheat and bulb charges. What is exactly inside of this little tube? What's it do? And why do we choose what we put in there? Okay. So to start off with, you'll see that this, okay, well, this is an air conditioning valve. This is something you'd see in like a rooftop unit. It's brass body, copper connections. And this right here is your external equalization connection. An external equalization connection has the function of bringing the pressure at the outlet of the evaporator. And this is important. It's important in multi-circuit evaporators where you have a distributor. A distributor introduces a pressure drop in the system. We've got a picture of one right here we can look at. And by using an external equalized valve, okay, it takes the pressure and it puts that up under the diaphragm here. And that pressure it takes already includes all the pressure drops in the system or in the evaporator and in that distributor. So it gives a more accurate representation of what that pressure is in the evaporator. So here we have a TU valve and you can see this TU valve right here this has an external equalization connection this one doesn't so in the case of this one this is going to your evaporator it's got some openings in here that allow that pressure up under the diaphragm however it doesn't know there's any pressure drops further down here so if you utilize one of these with a large pressure drop such as you see in a distributor Whatever temperature equivalent that pressure drop is, and keep in mind, some of these distributors can have a 20 or 30 pound pressure drop. That could be 10 or 15 pounds or 10 or 15 degrees equivalent. You are going to add that to the amount of superheat required for this valve to open up. So if this has got a factory superheat of, say, 7 degrees or static superheat of 7 degrees, the valve's not even going to open up until you have a value of 7 degrees. That's pretty standard. So if I'm going to add a further 15 degrees to that because of the pressure drops, that I'm not taking into account with with an internal equalized valve, you add 15 to seven, that means you need 22 degrees of superheat before that valve is gonna open up. So if you need a distributor, or if you have a distributor, always use an external equalized valve. You can use one of these if you don't need it. However, you can never use an internal equalized valve if you need an external equalized valve, all right? And since we're talking about superheat, when you're setting superheat on this valve, when do you do it and how much superheat do you need? Well, that's not an easy answer to give, especially when it comes to how much superheat do you need. Normally, it's based on the load, and that's still true. The greater the load on, the, on a system with a TXV, the more superheat you're going to have. It may not be as high as with a piston or a cap tube, but you're still going to have greater superheat because you've got to compress that spring in there more in order for the valve to open up. Okay, So in this case, Pull that cap off, put an Allen key in there, and adjust it. So for every turn clockwise, you increase superheat. For every turn counterclockwise, you decrease it. Same with this one. Pull that nut off, put your refrigeration wrench on there, turn it clockwise, increase in superheat, counterclockwise decreases it. But here's the thing. The rate of change for superheat per turn is four times higher with this valve than it is with this one. So before you start going nuts on this thing, make sure you know how much superheat change you're putting in per turn of the spindle. Otherwise, it's going to get pretty heavy. When you're adjusting superheat, 
Always wait until the load is relatively steady. What steady mean? Well, steady means it's not changing quickly. So sometime between the system coming on and turning off. Probably a good example of a really non-steady state is when you're coming off a defrost or you're just starting the system up and commission it or it's been off for a while. Everything in there is warm. There's a ton of load. The system's probably going to run for a couple of hours before you finally get it close to being satisfied. Once you get it pulled down and you're operating on the thermostat between cut in and cut out, okay, as close as you can get to where the system is being satisfied, that's about as close to steady as you can get. Fine tune your superheat. I highly recommend you use one of our apps. We have a link here for it, where you input some few basic parameters, such as evaporator temperature and room temperature. You add those parameters and it will tell you a target superheat. Okay, and it works very, very well. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. Okay, is it 100% accurate? No, but it's probably 95% and it will definitely give you a good idea of where to be. Obviously, if the manufacturer has specific values that you need to look for, start with them. But if you're just out there working on equipment that's been around for a while, it's a great tool to have. Another thing that you'll notice is brass body valve, okay, copper connections. This has to be wet wrapped. Always make sure you wet wrap this and use lots of heat, lots of torch pointed away from the valve, but towards the connection, heat that up as quickly as possible, then heat the pipe up before you put your solder on there. Don't be afraid to use lots of heat, just don't blow a hole in the pipe, which means practice, okay? Grab some old valves, practice brazing them in, and then unsweating them. Keep doing that until you can do it in your sleep. Because if you've seen some of the stuff that comes back from the warranty pile that have been brazed in, they look pretty scary, okay? Don't be one of those guys. This is a little different situation. Stainless steel body, copper connection. Copper ends up in here. When you braze this in, you braze this as you would any copper to copper connection. With the difference is you don't wet wrap this, okay? It will also heat up incredibly fast because all you're heating up is this little piece of the valve right here. So heat the pipe first, backwards to what you do with a brass body valve, and then heat that lip up, put your brazing rod in there, and when you see it flow all the way around, you're inside, okay? And then you're done very, very quick, okay? So don't overheat these valves. So finally, let's take a look at our bulb charge. The bulb charge in here is designed to open and close this valve in a very particular way. So we put different mixtures of gases in here, including nitrogen, that allow this valve to open up slow or quick at low and high temperatures. It may give this valve a very wide operating range, like one like this with a universal charge, or it may have a more limited charge range, okay, where it's only designed to operate over a very narrow temperature range, but have a very specific opening profile for that, okay, and that's very important. You want to open more at low temp or less at low temp kind of thing, okay. Finally, you may have heard of what's called a maximum operating pressure valve, okay, MOP or pressure limiting valve. That valve has a reduced bulb charge and can only open the valve fully if the evaporator pressure is below a certain amount. So let's say your compressor can only handle a suction pressure of 60 pounds. So you put a valve in that once you get 60 pounds in the evaporator, let's say you're coming off a defrost or you're in pull down, the valve will not open up anymore and allow the evaporator pressure to go above 60 pounds. Because if that's all your compressor can handle, the last thing you want is this TX valve reacting to high load, dumping a ton of refrigerant in the evaporator and over amping your compressor motor. And that's exactly what will happen. Unfortunately, the drawback of that is your pull down times are going to be a bit longer. However, that's a, I guess, a small penalty to pay or an acceptable penalty to pay for not overloading your compressor. So that's about it. I hope you enjoyed this. It's a very quick video, but I just wanted to touch on a few things that a lot of people may not have thought about or may be new to them. And we're going to continue to do these. Hopefully we can improve them and come up with new ideas. And you guys are going to be a big factor in those ideas. So if you can provide us with some ideas for what to cover in the future, of course, questions once again are great. I appreciate looking on. I look forward to them. And I hope you can join us again in the future. Thanks and have a great day, guys. Bye.